Welcome, everyone, and thank you for your patience. My name is Rich Rossfelder. I'm VP of Strategic Communications with CCM Institute, and I'm very happy to be assisting with today's session. This conversation is meant to expand on the themes in the 3Q19 Commercial Real Estate Insights Report titled Retail Evolution Predictions for 2025. It's my pleasure to introduce CCIM Institute Chief Economist Casey Conway and CCIM Institute Workshop Leader Nate Worthen, who will be leading today's session. Uh, Casey, would you like to introduce yourself first? Sure. So today I'm wearing my CCIM uh, Chief Economist hat, and I also wear a couple of other hats. I am the uh, Director of Research and Corporate Engagement at the Alabama Center for Real Estate at the University of Alabama. So hello to our Acre crowd and Grayson Glaze, our Executive Director. And I also serve on the Board of Directors for a public industrial REIT known as Monmouth, and uh, we're one of the primary landlords for FedEx. So wel welcome and look forward to a good discussion. And Nate, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Excellent. So my name is Nate Worthen. I'm the owner and broker for Professional Real Estate Services. We focus on global corporate services. So we service corporate accounts around the globe and help them with portfolio optimization and transaction management. Thanks so much, Nate um, and Casey. Uh, so uh, when we talk about this new report, one thing is clear. It's not just another examination of retail's demise because quite the opposite is occurring. Uh, with retail sales increasing at an average annual rate in excess of 4.35%, the, the report is a story of how retail will continue to grow and evolve fueled by e-commerce, technology, logistics, and innovation. Uh, it, it tackles this very complex situation. Uh, for those who haven't had a chance to read it yet, the report includes five predictions about the future, which we'll cover in today's session, as well as some of the common myths and misunderstandings around retail today. I'd like to briefly look at those myths before we dive into the predictions. So, uh, number one, all of the recent retail banks for overseas and store closings must be due to a decline in consumer spending. That, that is challenged in the report. Uh, myth number two, we've seen so many store closings and bankruptcies recently that there must be some relief on the horizon. Myth number three, I intuitively we associate the growth in online retail with its inherent cost effectiveness as compared to brick and mortar. Myth number four, uh, and this, this one's most comforting to me as someone who spent far too much time in malls as a child, um, the, the myth that malls are obsolete and gone forever. Um, now, Nate, do any of these myths surprise you? Yeah, I was most surprised by myth number three. I, I was convinced, and I still have some part of me that's convinced that online retail is expanding because it is more cost effective. But Casey makes a pretty compelling um, argument for why it isn't, and especially for online apparel, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, so, uh, so Nate, it's, it, it's great. I'm glad to have some pushback on it. It actually surprised me as well. You, you would think with the growth that online is where it's going to be, but it somewhat makes sense. And we kind of stumbled onto this when we were doing our logistics infrastructure paper uh, late last year that we published earlier this year with our, our funny transformer. And uh, what, we, what, what is the genesis behind this is that the cost of last mile and the delivery and the free shipping far exceeds the uh, cost of occupancy costs for, for physical stores. And so uh, how retailers come to grips with last mile and the full online delivery and free shipping is it going to be the expense of occupancy costs in physical retail stores or is the technology um, in other business models that are being tried by say Kroger and Walgreens or Walmart where you come pick your stuff up instead of having a bunch of Mercedes vans driving around is going to be interesting but the, the numbers on the slide there are pretty compelling when you see that you know in store you're almost a one-third profit margin 
uh, online that drops right to 30%. And then if you look at, um, if you do the online in the store and, and pick it up, uh, go online and pick it up the store or online ship uh, from the store, uh, you know, look at look at uh, look at how those margins dropped to uh, 12 to 23 percent. So I think it really is telling how expensive and urgent a problem it is to solve last mile, and uh, whether we stay with free shipping or whether free shipping kind of goes the way of, of free milk at the grocery store. The thing that enticed us in gets gets taken away. Your thoughts, Nate? Yeah, really interesting. I think retailers have to adapt. The demand and convenience of online is critical to compete. I think you have to have an online component. But like you said, do retailers absorb those last mile costs or do they pass them on to consumers and how do they do that effectively? It, it's interesting. And, and the retail real estate market is going to have to adapt to that. Yeah, yeah, great point. Yeah, I'll give you a share one other anecdote. I recently was with um, Home Depot and they were sharing, they have three primary mega distribution centers in the United States, uh, California, Ohio, and Georgia. And they were sharing a couple of interesting thoughts on this. So one is that each one of those distribution centers uh, basically services over 200 stores. So when you think of one, two million square foot facility servicing the needs of you know, 200, 100,000 square foot stores, that's a pretty efficient savings. The other thing is they said that, you know, 20 to 30% of their merchandise, they never really handle. So for example, if you order, say a Black & Decker tool, it may not come from their warehouse. It may be something through their technology they source directly from the Black & Decker factory to your home. So it, when you get peel the onion back behind the scenes, it's really interesting the different things that are occurring here. And Casey, that relates directly to that first prediction in the, in the report, no? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, really, um, you know, how, how do we how do we get, you know, effective and how the retailers, what are the different kind of ways that they're evolving and remaking themselves? So, um, you know, as we get into, into later ones, we'll talk a little bit about you know, some of the different uh, property type mixes they might go to. But I think it extends into grocery. So we saw it with Amazon buying Whole Foods two years ago. Now we see the growth in Walmart and Target. Um, and how they're doing it. And, you know, the question develops, you know, is, is retail the next kind of vacant department store category out there? And how, how do we do our groceries? So I, I can share anecdotally, you know, I do a little study each, each quarter with my, with my wife's mom's club group and survey with their shopping behaviors and habits. And, you know, they share with me, you know, five years ago, what they bought at a grocery store today, about 70% of that they order online and it comes to the house. So anything kind of bulky or non-perishable and other than maybe uh, fruits and vegetables and fresh meat is about all they go to the store for anymore. But you're exactly right. This is not limited to just apparel and department stores and stuff we buy at a mall. It's expanding into grocery. It's expanding into auto dealerships. It's also having a big impact in things like if you think of banking as a retail activity, what do we do with all the branch banks that are being closed? What are you experiencing, Nate? Yeah, Casey, that's a great point. What's interesting is you said, you know, DCs are handling maybe 200 store locations. And I was in Northwest Arkansas last week meeting with Walmart. I had a meeting with one of their senior uh, real estate portfolio managers. And they said, okay, we have DCs that service 200 or 400 stores at a time. But the challenge now is in direct to consumer delivery. Imagine a DC that has to support 1.2 million households as opposed to 400 stores. That's really the issue that I think you've uh, effectively highlighted. And to that point, Walmart is only opening five domestic super centers in the United States, but they're opening more than a hundred pickup locations, which there's no point of sale. This is just retail pickup locations for consumers. So it's an interesting strategy that's evolving in the big box market. Yeah, and, you know, it's, you know, a lot of us deal with things other than the big box. We deal with, you know, restaurant and casual dining and all that other stuff. And um, so we, two weeks ago, we hosted an event in Birmingham with ICSC and we were fortunate enough to um, be able to get um, the head of real estate development for Chick-fil-A to come over and talk to us about what they're doing in terms of online and 
Of course, they've gone a different path than McDonald's. They, they're using more of an app with a loyalty rewards program. But the success they're having is meaning they have to reconfigure, you know, their site selection and how a restaurant fits on their site. They need more dedicated uh, drive, drive, drive up pickup. Uh, lanes. They need more dedicated lanes for just online orders. And they're finding that often you put two kitchens in these restaurants instead of one because the orders get screwed up less if you have a second kitchen that's just handling online. So I think when we talk, Rich, about you know how we reimagine retail, it's it's really not just big box and department stores and, and malls, but it really extends into everything we consume from a car vending machine to, to retail and restaurants. That's a great uh, transition, Casey, into the next point, uh, the next prediction in the report, which is about co-retailing, uh, which, which many probably aren't as familiar with. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So um, the, the, the fun, exciting part is I spent some time over the summer actually visiting some of this related to um, uh, really what's going on in hospitality. And one of the for, things we conclude in this prediction number two is that maybe retail's new showroom is in a hotel. Getting some background, Rich, are you getting it? Yeah, it sounds like a bit of Go ahead. There we go. Okay. So one of the one of the things is is retail's new showroom going to be in hospitality. So there's a number of examples of this, whether you know those of you in the Midwest are probably familiar with Great Wolf Lodge. They've got everything from Build-A-Bear shops and Disney stores and fast food restaurants to Marriott and um, Hilton hotels are partnering with, with, with entities to bring more retail into the, uh, into the hotel and, and partner up on their loyalty programs. So just like the airlines did decades ago with car rental and uh, hotels, we, we could see these, ho- these uh, retail loyalty programs and apps partner with hotel. And there's a there's a dual benefit here that all property owners are struggling with, and that is, you know, maybe we're after 122 months of recovery, maybe we've we've pushed rents pretty far, and how we squeeze extra profit margin out means creativity and use of technology. So, for example, a retailer can uh, get into a hotel with less occupancy costs. They can better identify and stratify their their brand loyalty. So, if you're a customer that loyal to um, Marriott Suites hotels or Hilton Comfort Suites or a Choice Hotel brand, as a retailer, I can identify you and target to you. The hotel gets the benefit of what the retailer is doing is they're lifting the burden from the hotel person, the cost of staffing, say, a a, a retail shop, of decorating it, of refixturing it. And uh, one great example we use in the paper here is restoration hardware. So restoration hardware, if those of you in Chicago, if you're visiting or in the area, go look at what they've done. They've gone into, into a museum. They're going into all kinds of places and partnering with, um, with hospitality. So we really think that we're going to see, driven by efficiencies and the need to reduce occupancy costs, uh, maybe to, to you know, get the margins better, that retail is going to be partnering and aligning with more services. And hospitality is one example that we showcased here. So I don't know if you're seeing some others, Nate, or your thoughts on what you're experiencing. Yeah, this is an interesting reimagine for retail. Ho- hopefully you can hear me a little bit better. I think I was a little soft before. Um, hospitality co-retailing, I think it's also an emerging opportunity. Though there's some who have discovered, like Restoration Hardware, this opportunity already, and they're doing very well. I represent a global retailer called Peterson Worldwide. You may know their brands as Caraloha, a bamboo product, or Del Sol. They have products that change color in the sun. They, so there's a few reasons why they've chosen to capitalize on this hotel co-retailing. And I think it's not just hotels. Casey, you talk about airports, and I think cruise destinations are another great location for some of this co-retailing. And the reason, I think there's three reasons. One is there's a lot of captive foot traffic. In a hotel, you have to go through the lobby to get in to the conference rooms, to get to a room, and and so you have to walk past the retail. So that's number one. Number two is, Customer acquisition costs are really low in a hotel environment because of the foot traffic and also because 
people are staying there for multiple days. They're seeing the same brand over and over. And then third, showroom storefronts like the kind that you're describing with restoration hardware have a compressed footprint. So your occupancy costs are compressed. And it also sets up a nice dropship strategy. You're not having to pay retail real estate prices for inventory storage in back office or back room. You basically have display items. People don't have a lot of room in their suitcase or luggage to purchase large items like you might find at Restoration Hardware and ship and take them home with them, but they can drop ship from that location. So it's a nice kind of flagship service only um, strategy. So yeah, Casey, I think you've nailed it. I think we'll see a lot more of that moving forward, even not just in luxury hotel brands, but in your mid-level brands too. I think you'll see some co-retailing there as well. Yeah, and I think the other one, I'm glad you mentioned the airports. Um, I've already, I've already onto the next paper, Rich. I already forgot half the stuff, right? <laughs> so also medical. Don't, don't overlook medical and hospital campuses. We're seeing a lot of that. I know uh, personally I have um, one, of, one of my doctor practices bought a, uh, an office building, a multi-story office building near a hospital campus uh, in suburban Atlanta, and they converted the whole first floor to retail. It had everything from a jumpy house thing for kids, a McDonald's, Starbucks, uh, you know, pharmacy, you know, food place, you name it. And uh, they, they said they're basically making enough off the retail rents on the first floor to basically pay the debt service coverage on the upper three floors. And, you know, as our medical, as we deliver all these different services, whether it's travel at airports or, um, you know, medical, where it's more of an outpatient program, we've all got to drag along other, other family members, whether it's grandma or grandpa or the kids, and we're stuck there for hours because you can't leave until they're through with anesthesia. So, you know, think about, you know, all the different ways and places retail can go and, and kind of be more efficient and cut the cost. So airports, travel, hospitals, uh, hotels, you name it. So exactly. Do you want us to move on to one of the others, Rich, or? I might have lost Rich for a minute, so maybe we'll, maybe we'll move on in case he lost a, you know, a connection there. But we could, um, you know, we could look under the under the next one. So we kind of covered that, uh, you know, reimagining retail, um, co-retailing pop-ups. The third prediction, you know, that we that we do as well in the paper, Nate, relates to um, kind of the whole logistics side. Uh, you know, how do we deal with the last mile? We touched on this a little bit earlier. But, um, you know, I, I think, Nate, you spent a good bit of time in and out of Florida. Uh, Florida becomes the first state next year where, where it will have fully authorized and passed the legislation and insurance regulations to allow oh, autonomous, autonomous trucking, trucking. On, on, onto on its, its uh, uh, freeway. freeways. So I'm getting, I'm getting some feedback. feedback. I'll take it off speaker, see if that helps. We, are we okay, Rich? Can you hear me, Nate? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. All right, well, we'll assume we're, we're on and we're going, so we'll, we'll move on forward. So anyway, you know, how we deal with last mile is changing. One of the examples that we put in the paper here was a new, a new project that's being developed in uh, Brooklyn, in the Red Hook area, those are familiar from that but it's a structure between um, uh, Goldman, uh, their asset group, and a developer, D DH um, Holdings, property holdings, and they're developing a multi-story distribution center. So this is almost like going back to the 1930s and 40s when Sears and Montgomery Wards, I don't think there's anybody on the phone old enough to remember that, right? <laughs> when Sears and Montgomery Wards had vertical distribution. And what's happening is the, the retail is really the converging of retail and industrial into one property type is what's occurring here. And these new distribution centers for e-commerce have changed the land to building ratio such that what used to be a three to four to one land to building ratio for a warehouse is now like seven to one. And so in places like New York or Miami or San Francisco, LA, you just can't assemble that type of land. So we're gonna, we're gonna find new ways. There's a similar version of this one that's in the paper um, being done in Seattle where Amazon 
is going to be on the top layer, and then they just leased uh, the Home Depot below. So my theory is Amazon will always be on the top level, and then they'll spy on all the other retailers going down. <laughs> what are you seeing, Nate, in terms of how we solve Last Mile and autonomous vehicles and change in supply chain affecting kind of the, re- the retail and the real estate and maybe industrial as well? Are we still connected? Okay, sorry, I got I got muted. I think to help with that feedback. Oh, okay. <laughs> so Casey, no, I think you've nailed it. So here's I, I'm a real estate broker. So I think this is interesting conversation, but how does this really relate to the types of deals that I'm doing and to to to, to two different people, the retailers and then the logistics companies um, who are and, and the suppliers who are delivering product for those retailers, a lot of those are third party services. So for us, when you talk about autonomous vehicles and you talk about last mile delivery, what we're talking about is a large increase in volume of the number of vehicles on the road, right? Because we're not servicing 200 store locations anymore. We're servicing millions of households across the United States. So I'm in Salt Lake City, Utah, and our our yard space requirements have gone through the roof and yard space has kind of been the redheaded stepchild of um, industrial space. It's kind of a tag along. So you've got distribution space, you need some yard space for uh, 18 wheeler storage, but now we're, we're seeing that yard space, sometimes people are leasing that on their own for distribution and it's gone in our market from $1,000 per acre per month on average to $1,500 per acre per month on average in just five years. So we're talking about an eight and a half percent annual increase. Imagine if we, if landlords took this metric and in their leases, they had a separate escalation rate for yard space. Could they, could they glean a few extra hundred or a few extra hundred dollars a month in rent? I think they could. I don't think yard space is ever going to take over base rent metrics uh, for valuation or that sort of thing for industrial distribution space. But I do think there's increased demand and whoever can get on top of that first, I think can be a market leader when it comes to distribution, uh, vehicle storage, um, and maximize on that capital opportunity. Yeah. So I think, I think that's your, your exactly spot on there. So let me, we'll see if we can blow the audience's mind a little bit. So, some have heard me speak a little bit about this, but we actually have a new metric that um, I think will uh, trickle down to exactly what you're talking about at the, at the warehouse and the retail level. It's on page 13 of the, of the paper and it's called OTIF for, and it stands for on time and in full. And Walmart actually implemented this, believe it or not, back in 2017, mid, mid the summer 2017. And what they were finding is in the whole e-commerce world, it's very important that you're able to deliver on your promises for when you're going to provide uh, online purchase uh, goods and that they um, be in full, that your shipments arrive with everything that you've ordered and whatnot. So Walmart implemented this as a test case in 2017. And what they basically said is, we're going to tie your compensation as a shipper and supplier to how well you deliver goods on time and in full. And the initial metric was around 75%. And they essentially said, here's your penalty. If you fail to deliver 75% of your shipments on time and in full, we're going to impose a penalty equivalent to 3% of the value of all those shipments on you. That essentially wipes out the profit margin for most of these uh, suppliers and shippers um, and fulfillment entities. And so Walmart didn't meet with much resistance, and they actually have increased it now to like 78% for this year, and we're seeing other retailers pile on. So I had an interesting discussion with an entity I I can't disclose that actually said, Casey, could this trickle down to, say, uh, retail locations and and, – and e-commerce fulfillment warehouses where the real estate gets an OTIF score. So if you, like you were just talking about, Nate, if you have a a facility that doesn't have enough trailer pad parking to drop things, or you don't have, you're in an area that's heavily congested and the trucks can't get in and out of there very efficiently, 
you might end up with a lower OTIF score. And could that affect things like occupancy rates, rental rates, cap rates? And so they're, they're asking for some research around that. And I'd be curious in your thoughts, Nate, whether you think we could take this concept of OTF, OTIF for the retailers trying to get the shippers to deliver on time, but that actually to trickle down to the property level and have property metric implications. Yeah, Casey, that's really interesting. I don't think that we're going to see an OTIF metric on offering memorandums for industrial space. I, I, don't, think, <laughs> I don't think real estate, uh, because there's really two issues here. One is where's the real estate located? How do you get in and out of the real estate? But number two is how good is the operation? How good is the execution? And real estate really can't solve that problem. And so it, and I think real estate is probably the smaller of the two issues. But how, I guess the question for us real estate, uh, commercial real estate practitioners is how can real estate selection and design enhance logistics performance for third party retailers or, or third party suppliers really is what we're talking about is how do suppliers not get penalized if they don't hit the OTIF score that Walmart or any other retailer might put on them. And, and I think what we'll see happening is two things. First is I think a lot of us are familiar with WeWork, right? The office model where there's co-working space, it's easy to can, uh, expand and contract your space and, and WeWork absorbs that uh, for the profit margin. That's already happening in the distribution space. And I think we're going to see more of that where successful logistic um, operators are taking their space and saying, we already have the real estate. We already have uh, the logistics in place. Let's allow suppliers to piggyback on our execution and we'll offer a fee for storage model. I think we're going to see more of that and there will be an opportunity for brokers to work in that space. At least that's my belief. The second would be, I think when we get around distribution centers for large big box retailers like Walmart, Amazon, others, we're going to see suppliers cluster around those distribution spaces. If I can get, if I only have to move a mile or 10 miles to get from my DC to yours, that's a lot easier to do than to battle all of the unknown variables of having to ship across multiple states or multiple markets. So I think those are the two implications that I see as a real estate professional. Yeah, no, I think, I think those are, uh, are, are right on, on spot. I think, you know, CCIMs are great at connecting the dots and be forward thinking. And if you think about kind of how this paper started out, you know, uh, debunking myths. So anytime you want to solve a problem, you better really understand what the, what the basis of the problem is. And then moving on to some challenges and predictions. And if we now unmask that, uh, online retail isn't as profitable as in store, but the the marketplace isn't going back. How do we how do we improve that profitability situation to deal with going from say 10% online retail to 20%, which is the forecast in this paper by 2025, and I, I think that's very conservative. Um, we're going to have to solve a lot of these issues, and I my proposition is that we're going to see new linkages and metrics between industrial and retail. Um, that we haven't thought through for. So whether it's an OTIF metric on time in full, whether it's like you suggested, you know, being able as an industrial property owner to charge some fees to store the trailers on site and, and deal with the shipping. Um, my, my, my bet is that we're going to see some, some new items, some new metrics um, that redefine it. Just like in hotel, we have retail come into hotel more what does that do to the old metrics of RevPAR in a hotel? So we work, you know, what does it do with operating expenses? And I think that's the big takeaway, whether we think retail, office, industrial, um, a lot of these metrics are changing by how different property types and uses are aligning with different services to complement each other. And uh, I think we need to, we need to think about how to get in front of that. Do we, do we get you back rich or should we just keep charging? I think we might have lost Rich. Uh, something must happen there. So we'll keep going unless you have anything else there, Nate, on that third prediction. Uh, so on our on our fourth prediction that we got is what what's old is new again. And the reason I put this in here is I I strongly believe uh, it was last summer that we published with CCIM the adaptive reuse paper, and that we highlighted that um, 
you know, adaptive reuse was not well understood. Heck, until we wrote the paper with CCIM, nobody really even had an official definition of adaptive reuse or quantified it. And what we discovered was adaptive reuse as a property type is actually larger than self-storage. And so one of the ways I think we're going to deal with this um, change in the retail landscape and, and smaller stores or fewer stores in favor of online commerce is what do we, what do, we do to repurpose all this stuff? Um, and so a lot of people have used the term experiential. I think there's, there's um, other terms. Or, uh, it's, it's much broader than just doing an experience example we put in the paper was the old uh, Stapleton uh, air traffic control tower, the Stapleton airport in Denver, um, that is, is now a, you know, a punch bowl social entertainment event. But um, I think adaptive reuse is an important one. We're seeing everything from, you know, old, old industrial manufacturing being converted to housing. We're seeing adaptive reuse, these old department stores uh, and retail stores being converted um, to, you know, to housing, to warehouse, uh, you know, you, you name it. Um, in Chicago, uh, where the Institute is, if you're back visiting, the iconic crate and barrel store on Michigan Avenue uh, that went uh, that went away is, is a 43,000 square foot store is being taken over by Starbucks into a mega kind of entertainment deal with a their new roastery concept with restaurants and entertainment and co-working and all of them bundled into it. So I don't know, Nate, if you're doing much in the in the way of adaptive reuse or whether you think what role you think adaptive reuse is going to play here, but I think it's going to be an important one. Yeah, I mean. You know, if you're on the CCIM open forum, it, not a couple days goes by without someone saying, hey, we've got an empty big box space and we'd love for someone to backfill that space. I mean, we're talking about hundreds and thousands of big box spaces that are vacant today uh, because of this, of what we're talking about uh, right now. The challenge, I think, for adaptive reuse and, and Casey, no offense, but academically, I think it makes all the sense in the world. And, and most of us can see that. The problem is with political and legal issues. The political landscape is this. We have a large big box retailer who is paying a certain percentage of their sales in sales tax from which the local government, city or county was benefiting from. And they don't wanna see that backfilled by self storage or apartments or even office, right? They wanna see it backfilled by more retail and more sales. The problem is that those, there aren't any more big box retailers. They, what we have is what we have, and that's, that number is getting smaller, not bigger. So for instance, here, here's the challenge in our market. Best Buy opened their first new store in seven years in our market, a little, a little place called Farmington, Utah that's blowing up. Well, everyone in the surrounding 100 miles thinks, hey, we could backfill our space with Best Buy. That, the problem is that's not happening. That, that's false hope. <laughs> and so uh, this adaptive reuse requires uh, a rezone in almost every situation. And it requires working with local planning commissions, zoning offices to try to say, hey, can we get a mixed use uh, you know, variance here or rezone? And once we can convince the local uh, elected officials to do that and local city officials, I think we're gonna see a lot of success especially if we can show them how we're going to create retail sales. No one can backfill a big box retail space, but if we cut that retail space into thirds and shorten the depth, so we've got more frontage, less depth, a lot of smaller retail operations are going to be successful in those spaces. Add uh, apartments or office space to create demand, and these are great infill locations. So Casey, I think you've, you're on it. Uh, I think if we could attract more city council members to join our calls, maybe they could see the benefit as well. No, you're, you're exactly right. And, uh, you know, in our adaptive reuse paper, the CCM paper from last summer, so we looked at over 100 MSAs zoning ordinances to see who had anything that would be a, the slightest bit accommodative to adaptive reuse. We didn't find very many examples, but the one that we found that just hit the ball right out of the park, I'll tip my hat to our Arizona CCIMs, was Tucson, Arizona. And I'll be honest, that was the last place in the world I thought we would find the solution to a comprehensive zoning ordinance for adaptive reuse. But they, they really did a great job addressing all the issues, whether it's parking or setbacks or life safety items or targeting buildings that had been vacant a long time. It's been very successful. And so since we published that paper a year ago, 
there are at least 50 uh, MSAs in secondary and tertiary markets that I can point to that have gone to the city of, uh, city of Tucson, Arizona, downloaded their zoning ordinance, and have now implemented their own adaptive reuse sub or complete um, zoning ordinance. I think there is hope out there, Nate, that we're, we, we can make uh, progress by example. So there's a good example where CCM, I think, is making a difference. The other one that I would um, point out that you, you mentioned there is when you look at this issue of property tax and why adaptive reuse, why understanding what's going on in retail, debunking the myths, and, and then understanding the predictions is property taxes. So I, I, our last prediction deals with uh, nothing is certain except death and property taxes. I think, uh, I think all of us have experienced at least one of those, right? <laughs> We're hoping not to experience the first one. So on the property tax issue side, we're finding that these local governments and municipalities, as they see these retail projects go empty, the big box store goes empty, the mall goes dark. Um, we have 13 to 1400 malls in the country. Our forecast is about 400 of those will go dark by 2022 to 2025. We're losing or closing about 75 malls a year. That's, that's mind numbing. When you think about it. Uh, we have over 115,000 uh, anchored shopping centers in the country. Uh, in 24 square feet of retail per man, woman, child, rodent, cat, dog, you name, you name it, uh, more than double anywhere else in the world. And that's all got to get right size and contracted. So what does local government do with this building inventory of empty retail? So does it wait for the property tax bill to come in and, and, and value it on a dark, unutilized basis? Or do they work collectively with groups like CCIMs to help find an alternative uh, repurposing of that property. And, and the proposition is this, if they don't do it, 60% of local government revenue comes from property taxes. And that's largely balanced on the back of commercial real estate. So depending on the value of the homes that are around your, your mall or your anchored shopping center, one big box or department store has traditionally paid property taxes that equate to the equivalent of something between 100 and 200 homes, depending on the price, size, and value of those homes in the surrounding neighborhood. So this year, if we closed 10,000 stores, last year we closed about 6,000. 2017 was the last record at eight, at eight, little over 8,000. 2014 to 2017, we were closing five plus thousand a year. So if you look at the last three years, we'll have closed 20,000 big box and anchored stores this is a huge impact on local re on local government uh, revenue funding. And the solution is not the internet sales tax. Um, and while that's being addressed, um, because most of the collection of that goes to the state coffers and the state level that doesn't fully trickle back to the local government level. So local governments have a financial and a fiscal vested interest in working with groups like CCIMs in the industry and realtors to figure out how to put these assets back to a productive use. If not, they're cutting their nose to spite their face. These assets will stay empty. Developers will get frustrated, and they uh, and they won't uh, proceed with you know many of the adaptive reuses. So, I think this is really one of the big issues that's coming at us head on, in a potentially a, a local government funding crisis ahead of us, and why we really have to understand what's happening in retail, how to repurpose it, where the revenue goes. You know, maybe the revenue is we tax big e-commerce distribution centers more, uh, but there's still fewer fewer of those than, than retail stores. So I don't know what your thoughts are, Nate, on the property tax issue, but I'm I'm very concerned about it, and it's kind of why we wanted to conclude the paper on that. Is I think all of us in our industry are going to be called upon by our local leaders to help them figure and sort this out, and so we better sort it out ourselves first. Any thoughts? Yeah, I think you're right. And and Casey, you're more of an expert here than I am. I know that you just got back from litigation on this very issue in another state. It's and so um and, and just to be clear, you weren't being litigated against. You're there for an expert witness. So so that's good. Um <laughs> the, the, way, the way the property tax landscape works for us, and, and I think it's it's very common across um different states is first of all, single family homes don't pay for themselves. So they're being subsidized. Uh, you know, the services they receive from their municipality are being subsidized by commercial real estate, which you alluded to. And so the way the game works is the county 
although they know they pretend they play dumb and they go to these vacant uh, retail boxes and they say, oh, your assessed value was X last year. Let's just add 3% or whatever it is this year. And then the retailer, of course, says, wait a second, or the landlord really says, wait a second, this is vacant. I'm not getting any income. I, this does not have the same value that it used to. So they appeal the property taxes and then we turn, we have a battle on our hands. And the question is really, how does the municipality recapture the difference between occupied retail uh, real estate versus vacant retail real estate? And there's a, there's a big gap there. And not to mention sales tax, right, which we've talked about. So in, in the paper, which will be made available um, for everyone after this call, or after this webinar is published, you, can, you suggest maybe there's a strategy where uh, municipalities, maybe they target e-commerce uh, or, um, or distribution, last mile distribution as a place to make up for that sales, because that's where it's happening. The same amount of product or more is being purchased by consumers. It's just coming from a different, through a different source. I'm not so sure that that is how municipalities are gonna recapture that tax. I think in, it's hard for um, municipalities to really differentiate between industrial uses for e-commerce versus industrial uses for wholesale distribution or manufacturing purposes. I think most likely the easiest uh, path forward is that everyone else absorbs their pro rata share, residential, office, industrial, land. Uh, we, we all have to absorb uh, the difference, our pro rata share of what that loss is. And that's going to be painful for a lot of us. But I, I don't know what the solution is. We should probably stay ahead of it so that we're not the ones receiving it. We're the ones creating that policy and legislation. So yeah, great points, Casey. Yeah, no, so my, my fear, Nate, is what happens at most, um, most politicians is when there's a problem, they first go on a trip to Egypt to the River Denial, and they hang out there for a while until they get thrown out of office, and then we got to get somebody in there to actually deal with the problem. And I'm hoping that, you know, here the uh, Institute is, is trying to help promote an idea. It's not the complete solution, but if we can help find ways to put these assets back to productive use, uh, it'll be one way that will um, mitigate the increase that maybe has to be borne because obviously it costs so much to run the schools and police and fire and we'll have to spread that around wherever the, wherever the gap is. Um, so I know we're we're getting near the end. I, I see there's a couple of questions. I don't know if, if you're back on, Rich, um, but I see there's yeah, a couple. Can you hear me, Casey? Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Yep, um, yes, we great transition. Thank you. We do have a few questions from the audience. So uh, let's dive into those. Um, the first one was a question about clarifying the, uh, the emergence of autonomous vehicles in the state of Florida. Um, some folks uh, maybe needed a little more detail on that, weren't sure. Can you, can you tell us a little more of that story, maybe just a minute or two? Sure, so the Florida legislature actually passed legislation this summer that um, fully authorizes the use of autonomous trucks throughout any uh, U.S. state or federal highway in Florida starting uh, January of next year. So the legislation dealt with all issues like insurance. Uh, so if a, if a rogue truck uh, goes off and runs over somebody, what the, what the insurance liability limits are going to be. It also set up things where the trucks have to uh, be monitored by the equivalent of like an air traffic control system. So there'll be a, there'll be a number of centers and they've identified the vendors that they're going to use. So when a company launches an autonomous truck, say from Miami to come up to Orlando or, or Lakeland uh, to deliver goods, it will actually be monitored. There'll be a controller that will monitor some numbers, say 10 trucks at a time until they reach their destination. But Florida will be the first state in the union uh, January of next year that will have fully authorized and dealt with all of the legal logistics and technology issues to allow autonomous trucking statewide. So first in, first in the country, there are other states where this is starting to happen. The legislation hasn't been fully done. I'd say Arizona is probably next in the line and they're doing it more with um, uh, uh, Uber and passenger vehicles than trucking. Uh, but UPS has already got a pilot underway between um, Phoenix and Dallas with autonomous trucking. But Florida is the first state to get it all done. Thanks, Casey. Uh, we had another question about co-retailing. So are, are municipalities open to rezoning where conflicts exist for a co-retailing type of setup? 
Yeah, Rich, let me take this one. So um, here's the thing. I, this, this question is, is really astute because we really need to get ahead of these uh, hotel and hospitality developers as soon as we can. The, the reason for that is because a lot of hospitality retailers aren't or hospitality developers aren't thinking about lobby retail. So first of all, we got to get in front of developers first. Secondly, we don't have the same challenges with traditional retail. We don't have NIMBYs. We don't have uh, residential um, neighbors who are saying, I don't want a Starbucks in my backyard. I don't want a big box retailer in my backyard. I don't want a smoke shop. That, those people don't exist in the hospitality sector. And the third thing is that local municipalities are almost always open to sales tax and this helps them generate that. So we're talking about enhancing property values, enhancing sales tax. In my experience, municipalities are very open uh, to multi-use development when it comes to retail and hospitality. I don't think there's a lot of objections in that space. Yeah, so I think they, you hit the nail right on the head when, when you talk to them in terms of um, revenue <laughs> and collection of taxes, uh, you get their attention and, and win their hearts over. But some of the areas where I see that they fight this a little bit uh, are particularly around parking. Um, so in, when retail goes in the hotel, they think they need to add more parking, where in fact, we're finding that isn't the case. So a lot of times these government officials, they don't know what they don't know. And that's why papers and research like this or adaptive reuse really help not only through the research, but the visualization. The reason we include so many exam visual examples of adaptive reuse was to show the different kinds of things that can be done, that it's scalable, that it can include an infrastructure to give green space. And the other on, on retail is to show them the severity of the number of problems that they're facing in stores going dark. So they, they truly appreciate there's a sense of urgency here. Um, believe it or not, there are not, um, most of your planning and zoning government officials uh, did not take any courses. They didn't have an existence, um, <laughs> you know, 10, 10 or more years ago when they went through their graduate school programs on, on planning and zoning and development for how to deal with this stuff. So they, they really are struggling to know how this stuff works, how you repurpose it. And, um, you know, often the easiest, safest answer for a government official is, is no or to table it rather than to take action. So we're trying to get help get in front of them as an industry resource with this type of knowledge and content uh, to, to help kind of give them some framework to operate. But you're, you're right, Nate, start the dialogue with here's where I can help you on the revenue side. You'll, you'll always make further progress with that argument. Good, good, good observation. Thanks, Nate and Casey. I think we, we can go uh, just a few minutes over. Um, so thanks for your patience here. Uh, I, I think we had a question about Walmart's efforts related to property taxes and how um, Walmart is actively trying to get their real estate taxes reduced uh, based on empty value, uh, not net lease investment property or active viable retail. So Casey, do you know anything about this and are you able to expand on it or, or Nate? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, my head is scarred with uh, with dents on it from this story. So what's, what's really happened is in the property tax world in most states, the basis for tax assessment is the is the um, fee simple interest of the market value. And so fee simple means I've got the right to release it. So you assume the store, uh, whether it's occupied or not, is open uh, to put a market rent in there. So most of them it's fee simple market value, uh, assuming occupancy. So they don't assume you have a Walmart go dark and you have to retrofit it and then lease it up. Simply state that you put the market rent in. Well, market rent is not the contract rent. When Walmart leases and opens a new store, you can have a myriad of things that go into that lease. I've seen leases with Walmart where it included the inventory of the first time the fixture of the store with all the fixtures and the inventory. So that's part of the amortizing element. Uh, and it's not leased fee. Leased fee interest is less than the bundle of rights. So what happened is the tax assessors to try to battle this came up with this, what they call dark store theory. And they assumed that all of the evil retailers are trying to get their stores assessed, assuming they're all empty. And that is not the case. The, the law in almost all 50 states is the tax assessment is supposed to be based on the fee simple market value, assuming it's occupied. And that means you gotta figure out what the market rent is today. And, and not just value it assuming the contract rent. The lease could have been negotiated 10 years ago. It can, include, it can include intangibles, inventory, fixtures. The duration of the lease is different. 
So you can't just say, well, here's a, here's a sale of another lease fee interest in a Walmart and I'll, I'll use it on this one. That one may be an old store that only has five years left on the lease. That's going to sell for a whole lot different um, in cap rate and other than say a new store. So it's a, it's a, a hot developing issue. Um, and that, if that helps kind of frame it is the assessors are trying to paint the, the retailers as evil corporate capitalists trying to steal lunch money from the children's mouths when really the retailers are just trying to say, look, it just fairly assess me uh, according to the law, which is my, the fee simple interest at market value at a market rent. So I hope that helps. Uh, you feel free to email me. I, I've got a lot on this. I do a lot of litigation. Um, my, my personal email is just the initials KCMAICRE at gmail.com. And I'll, I'll be glad to spend more time off, offline. Great, thanks, Casey. Um, so I think I want I want uh, to include one last question, and we'll start with Nate. So, if commercial real estate professionals remember just three things from this new report and webinar, what do you think they ought to be, Nate? Yeah, I think number one. So, as real estate professionals, we're used to saying location, location, location. I, I think that's evolving. I think, especially for retailers and uh, industrial distribution center users we now need to think about logistics, logistics, logistics. Uh, and so that, that's number one. Number two, Casey's findings that online retail is not always necessarily more profitable than in-store retail and think apparel. I, I think that's a great takeaway. And then third, you know, I know that the big boxes are closing around the country. Casey's analysis shows 25% of malls are going to close in the next three years and I see that as a huge opportunity for adaptive reuse. If we can prime uh, the local municipalities for adaptive reuse before the mall goes dark, that's going to be a huge opportunity for most of us. Thanks, Nate. Uh, that was great. So um, I want to take this moment to give our sincere thanks to KC and Nate for leading the charge here. We will co collect some of the additional questions to try to answer those offline. Also, you will all have access to a recording of this webinar, which will be sent out via email very soon. I also encourage all of you to visit ccim.com slash insights to download the 3Q19 Commercial Real Estate Insights report. There is so much more information in that report than we were able to cover on today's webinar. And please, once you've uh, had a chance to take a look, share it. This is a resource for, uh, to position you as a thought leader as well. Share it on LinkedIn, share it with your colleagues and clients. And with that, um, I think that'll do it. So thank you all and have a great day. Thanks, Rich. And Nate. Thanks, guys.